Uh, welcome to today's lecture and today's lecture is a very special one. I'm at this quantum eco farm which is an aquaponic farm. Uh, we have been learning a lot about flow through system, pond system, recirculating system and today we get to see all this in application. Now with me here is Mr. Koo, uh, one of the owners of this farm and he started this project and uh, you can see that it has already uh, in progress and he has many more uh, set up to go through. So let's ask him, uh, when did you start this farm, Mr. Cook? Oh, okay, this farm was started uh, November last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because of the MCO. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of us, all of us actually, mm -hmm. are actually from oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, in between, you know, I do some small research uh, from home. And then uh, later stage, uh, when I was free, when I'm not working, then uh, there's a small farm in Gomba mm -hmm. from the Jabatan Petanian. So throughout the time, I cannot travel. That's why I stuck in Gomba and then do the, the research. Mm -hmm. And uh, because a lot of posting on uh, on the Facebook, and then you know, uh, the friends suggested why don't we just go and do a commercial farm. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, I started to work on the process plan, and then a uh, few people was interested. They found the time also here, mm -hmm. and uh, we just sit down and started. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, six of us, uh, we every each of us throw in some money, and then uh, we find the land. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, this land was uh, I searched for this land quite quite a long time because of the water quality, mm -hmm. and it appears that. Ais Langho is next to us, so the water quality is guaranteed. That's why uh, we started in here. So, uh, is it true that you are using tap water from Slango? Ais Langho? No, we are using ground water actually. Ground water? Ah, there is okay. a tube well, and mm -hmm. uh, there are two tube wells uh, in the front there, mm -hmm. and uh, we suck the water from the ground. Mm -hmm. So, it's ground water uh, source. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it was that so clean without uh, heavy metal contamination and then we, uh, we started this mm -hmm. okay so uh, it's been it's November to last November is it yes last November so to now it's almost year one now. year uh. so uh, how's your how's your journey in dealing with aquaponics is it what you expected uh, easier yeah. or harder oh well, um, I think most of the people started aquaponic has uh, conceptual ideas of growing veggies mm. from the from the fish mm. uh, waste. So the conceptual is whether you grow fish to plant uh, uh, veggies or you plant veggies to grow fish. Mm. These two ideas you look the same but I think there's a big difference mm. because uh, one is focused on the veggies mm. and the other one is focused on the aquaculture. Mm. So <coughs> Um, when we sit down and look at the, the, the commercial uh, model mm. and uh, we think without uh, big investment on the fish, mm. uh, even if you grow the veggies, mm. it's not economical mm. because you are using the aquaculture resources mm. just to plant the, the veggies mm. and the return will not be uh, what you call good enough mm. because you invest a lot because of the heavy equipment and all these things but your products is veggie mm. meaning that you will uh, have, have less uh, what they call output mm. compared to what you invest in mm. so that's why <coughs> if you look at here we are have, we have more fish than typical uh, aquaponic setup I mean the ratio and, and things like that alright so yeah okay so what Mr. Koo is saying, uh, he actually captured one of the essence of aquaponic production. Okay, whether the system is plant-oriented or fish-oriented, okay, it's always this balancing act between plants and fish. And this continues to this day to remain the holy grail of aquaponic. Can we actually balance these two to achieve the complete equilibrium that, is, that we so sought after in aquaponics? Okay, the aquaponics uh, as a background has been in research for at least 30 years now. Okay, many prototype farms have been started with some commercial farms started. But again, this continued to uh, remain one of the breakthroughs that we so sought after. So, 
So we shall see whether Mr. Ku will be able to break through this. So at this moment, we are, he is focusing on fish. It's a fish-oriented system. Okay, and, and as he has said, fish-oriented system because of the economics. Okay, fish fetch a higher price and of the investment that he has put in, uh, it's very reasonable that it should be a fish-oriented system. Okay, and uh, in a while we shall see how how the whole system uh, runs. Okay, uh, Mr. Kut, this pond here, what system is this? Okay, so so this is uh, what it, we refer as the IPRS, which is the, the Impon Raceway System. Mm -hmm. So many commercial farms these days use this uh, raceway system. Is uh, you create like an artificial uh, stream or river. So you get current uh, pushing the water through, and then <coughs> uh, the, at the same time you basically able to get the, the waste coming on one side, mm. and then you uh, what you call overflow the, the the waste, and then you you go into the settling uh, pond. Okay, we will look at the settling pond pond yeah. in a moment. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, we have been looking at raceway systems uh, in our past lectures and here you have it a commercial system uh, that is raceway based. So uh, Mr. Tu says this is an in-pond raceway system. So it's a hybrid between a pond and a raceway. And the idea is the water flows from one end and pushes it to this end here just like a river. And, and we have seen that this system has many advantages. And this system is based on a recirculating system, a recirculating raceway system that circulates throughout the entire entire farm here. And and again, if you see here at the top here, the overflow, this is one of the crucial pieces of equipment that we have been talking about. It is for the scum removal of the pond. Okay, although we have so much fish in the pond, there is actually comparatively very little scum on the surface because of this flow through. Okay, let's now go to the source uh, where the water is being pushed and see and we shall also look at the filtration system there. Okay, Mr. Ku and the partners are engineers. They are they are in the oil and gas. So when it comes to system design, aquaculture engineering, they know what they are doing. Okay, let, let us hear how the water flow moves in this system. Uh, Mr. Ku, what is this tank we are looking okay. at? So so this is called the settling tank. And uh, the way we design it is all the wastewater is flowing back to this tank by gravity. So in a way, we don't use too much pump. And because of the water level of uh, the pond is higher than the settling tank, it will fall naturally by gravity. All the, the fish waste will be collected. Here. And this fish waste is reusable uh, when this too much dirty and we have to clean we'll suck this uh, uh, all these things clean to the septic tank and when we put some uh, bacteria uh, to uh, what do you call this to, to make the water uh, full of nutrient and then we recycle the water for the chili plantation mm -hmm. ah. all right ah. okay um we have been talking about one one most important con simple concept but very fundamental that Mr. Ku just alluded to that water always always flow from the top to the bottom very simple concept but uh, when it's applied it's powerful this is a good example the raceway tanks is intentionally built higher than this setting tank and for this reason the water from the raceway tank enter to this setting tank through that pipe at the corner there Okay, you can see the water motion there. It's, I can see something flowing out of there. Okay, all the fecal matter of the fish you can see right now is flowing out. Okay, this is uh, evidence that the system is working. And this tank here is a settling tank. A settling tank meaning we want the fecal matters to settle at the bottom, and we want the fecal matter to be rem to be mineralized. Okay, to be converted into the nutrients and to be digested by the uh, by the microorganism in the water and ideally we want remember we have mentioned that in a recirculating system your first step the most important thing you need to do is to remove all the particle matters so that it is not reintroduced into your system okay this is what the setting tank is for 
So now let's look at the second component. Okay, here we have these uh, brushes. Basically, it blocks all the small particles uh, which is uh, floating uh, in the water. So usually when it's too small, it's unable to uh, settling, settling down uh, at the bottom. So when it passes through, it will stick on the, on the brushes and the water get cleaner here. And this bubble is simply to create a, a push away uh, force that you see the bulb when the, the particle coming through, it will push the particle back to that side. So in this uh, motion, which is uh, uh, using a bubble, but you cannot uh, have too powerful of bubble, otherwise you create a turbulent effect. So in a way, we just use a natural way <laughs> to to make sure the, the waste is uh, contained in this uh, pond. Okay, uh, so this is uh, the air bubble here is very similar to the air curtains. You know when you enter a shop there is an air curtain that prevents the air conditioning from escaping. This is the same concept is to prevent the particles from entering into the next tank and to contain it all within here. And this brush here is also uh, a, sediment, a sediment trap. You can see that it's rather efficient, okay? So, and the idea is it will progressively get cleaner as you move on to the second tank. Now, the, the water, I can see that it flows from the bottom to, the, to this side. Let's, let Mr. Ku explain this. Okay. So, so, once uh, the big solid is uh, settling down there, when you come to the second pond, we'll have the UV light to kill all the uh, harmful bacteria or whichever bacteria you have maybe in the system will kill them all because uh, we will have the biofilter on the other side and because of this um, now you get a secondary settling uh, effect and uh, we repeat the same thing but on the similar size however this time you can see the water is cleaner and we go through the brushes again and all this uh, green stuff on the surface is actually dark wheat so it's a, a supplement for the fish the fish like this type of dark wheat because uh, dark wheat is proven to be uh, beneficial for the for the fish or some people even use it for duck and uh, chicken and all that so <clears throat> one of the indicators also if the dark wheat cannot grow means the water nutrient is not enough or maybe if the dark wheat die off then the nutrient is too much uh, in such a way that we we have a good indicator whether uh, when we should change over some water uh, like cleaning the, the settling tank okay so these are uh, supplement for the for the fish and uh, we feed them once a week when it's food Okay. Now, duck, duck wheat as a feed has been in research for, for many years now. Okay? Uh, we, this is one of the application for duck wheat as a supplement feed for the tilapia. Tilapia is our omnivores. So, um, that is the, the UV light. The four of them is to, is, is to get rid of my, microorganisms. Okay, the, the idea is generally uh, there are exceptions but generally anaerobic bacteria are considered to be negatives and aerobic bacteria are considered to be positives and in this case this tank is most probably in anaerobic condition that is why the sterilization has to happen here and then in the next tank where the biofilter is uh, we are hoping that is a more aerobic bacteria which will perform all the nitrifications that we are after So those uh, bacteria uh, in the settling tank, it may have some harmful bacteria, which we don't want. That's why we kill all the bacteria in the process. And when we come to the last uh, pond for the filtration, this is our biofilter. Okay, so this is the biofilter whereby we give the oxygen, a lot of them, and inside 
we have three tons of uh, my fun stone and also coral stone which is full of uh, the calcium carbonate acting as a pH buffer so in a way the pH is stable because of the, the calcium carbonate uh, acid in the system uh, when the system creates acid because of the waste the calcium carbonate will balance it and the amount of the, the rocks that you put uh, you require to check the water regularly if the, the pH keep dropping you have to add more until it's stable Okay, so this is the aerobic biofiltration section. Uh, there is more aeration going on here. And the, the magic is supposed to happen here. This is where all the ammonia is converted to nitrates and <coughs> to prevent ammonia poisoning. And Mr. Ku has said that he has dumped 3,000 kg of stones in there. This is the Mai Fan Si and also the coral stones. All of them has the mineral properties and, and much surface for bacteria to colonize it. And, and this is the pump that is used to drive the, the fertigation, the, the sprinkler system that we shall look at the moment. And the amazing part to me of this system is there is a submersible pump right there that, that is only 330 watts. And this 330 watts is used to power this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 of the raceway. Okay, that is some serious engineering in my opinion. Okay, so I, I think that is a quite efficient use of energy there. And in aquaponics, uh, many times, what makes or breaks the farm is the energy. Okay, especially in a recycling system, uh, the pump usually will bankrupt you. Okay, if you don't design it properly, uh, it will not be profitable. So uh, six of them, the engineers have, I think, have done a good job here. And okay, let's, let's look at their, their sprinkler system. Okay, so when it comes to energy saving, we have put a lot of effort in this. Uh, number one, which is the submersible pump. We're using the low pressure and high volume uh, pump because literally you can see the, the head is not too much because the water level itself is only like 40 centimeters uh, different. So in a way, you don't need a pump with a, with a high pressure, but you need a volume so that you can deliver the water fast enough to the to the pond. Okay, that's one. Uh, the two is this pump is only running by timer. Uh, for using aeroponic, you don't need to water the plant 24 hours. So in our research and what we like to do is in any kind of method in aquaponic, Actually, the plant doesn't need 24 hours of water, but the moisture it is. You need the moisture, but the time for it to expose to water is no need to be 24 hours. So this is how it works. And <coughs> this plant is laying this way, so that it shares the same pump, and you choke the input of the water by using a valve. And this way, you can make sure the water is distributed evenly and uh, it goes to the pond and also it follows the same timer uh, of this centrifugal pump the system runs 64 times a day with 5 minutes uh, on time each time so in short these two pumps only run 5, five hours plus only in any single day so in turn uh, this will save us a lot of uh, energy. Okay. Okay. So it's it's not it's not just the efficient use of pump. It's also the amount of time it's used is also less. Uh, they have designed it in such a way. Um, okay, Mr. Cook, can you tell me why you are putting a shade cloth here? <laughs> so this shade actually is to prevent the algae from growing in here. Right. So we don't want the sun to to get here, but. Um, make sure the algae doesn't uh, uh, boom in, in this uh, pond. Okay. okay. Uh, nitrifying bacteria uh, tend to be compete with microalgae. So we usually want micro, uh, the bacteria to be in darkness. Okay, so that if sunlight comes in, the microalgae will take over the surface and uh, your bacteria will drop. 
Okay, so that is why there is a sh there is a almost 100% shade here, I think, uh, prevent the biofilter from exposed to sunlight. Now let's look at the plants now. Okay, uh, what we have here is a piece of foam uh, that is very special. Let let Mr. Cook explain about it. Okay, so this is called the XPX uh, foam, extruded polyestin uh, uh, foam, and typically this is used in uh, uh, what do you call country like they have winter so the, in the building uh, uh, of the wall and the floor they use it to uh, for, for insulation okay and this is not the the normal polyestin uh, bubble type uh, what do you call this uh, foam and the hardness and compressive strength is higher and also it doesn't absorb any water that's why it's suitable for this type of uh, 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 usage and uh, we have done this uh, quite a while now and what you do is you punch some hole here uh, according to a template then you can put your uh, seedling with the sponge over the, the hole and that's it because we try to simplify things without using the, the small uh, what you call bucket you know usually aquaponic practitioner they usually like to use a bucket to uh, put inside the, the hole so in that way we save uh, I mean we we cut down one procedure of using the, the bucket right okay so uh, if you I think mr. Ku is talking about that one the, the one with the holes are uh, you want to use hole? Okay, so typically in a in aquaponic system, holes are caught and they put what we call a net pot in there. And then, then you put your medium there, you plant the ceilings there. So Mr. Ku has uh, taken away the step and put the wool straight into the into this foam. And this foam uh, is high density. It does not absorb water. Okay, I have used the white foam before and over time it will take in water and it will just start to have lose its buoyancy and sink. So this is a, a very good material for use in aquaponics. And it costs uh, 10, 10 ringgit something? About 16 ringgit per piece here, uh, which I think is actually quite a good value. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is an insulator used in uh, winter countries and is now used, repurposed for aquaponics. Okay, now let's look at the plant section. Uh, this is some serious wall of vegetables here, and uh, we'll let Mr. Quick explain how, how it's grown. Okay, so this is um, what we call the aeroponic system whereby the water with nutrients are sprayed onto the root of the vegetable using uh, sprinkles. Now, you can choose uh, a lot of sprinkles which has um, higher pressure and smaller the, uh, uh, what they call water drops but we simply use a simple uh, sprinkler usually used for gardening irrigations and all that because of the cost saving and also uh, for easy maintenance the way we look at this is if you come over here you can see the root is hanging over the air and <clears throat> it has the advantages when your water sprinkler is stopped the root is exposed to the air which is plenty of oxygen then you will have time for it to expand uh, and uh, grow so compared to like the, 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 the rough or the deep water whereby you always have to put in oxygen uh, bubble for the root to grow healthily okay and also the way we choose this step is it give you more production per, uh, per area per acreage of your uh, uh, space and it also is quite maintenance free because you compare to other methods like the deep water culture over time you have to clean the pond this one after the, the harvesting you just reuse the pot again do not without having to uh, have too much of the maintenance okay mr ku just brought an important point here that plants roots actually require an aerobic condition okay uh, usually when your plants are sick whether it's planted in soil or using hydroponic matter if your plants are sick it's very high chance that the root is suffering from oxygen deficiency 
and we have entered into an anaerobic zone and in that zone is where all the diseases happen okay and aeroponics aeroponics based on the is based on the principle that the roots are suspended in the mid-air and water are sprayed to it you can as mr ko says use a mist system or you use an agricultural sprinkler the idea is is to wet the roots with nutrient water periodically and when it's not wetting the roots it's exposed to the air causing it to be saturated with oxygen and thereby preventing this dangerous anaerobic zone and and this aeroponic system is actually a development by nasa for their space exploration technology and uh, it has now been adapted for civilian use so a lot of the in fact hydroponic has its origin by nasa okay it was originally developed for space exploration and a lot of the cutting edge technology that we are using today is based is an offshoot of that project and and in this system uh let me see okay we can see the roots and it has uh, formed a mat on on the board here and when it sprays we can see that it, all of them will get wet and this is just a ordinary agricultural sprinkler which is quite inexpensive and and uh, and very often in aquaponics uh, your creative your creativity and your ideas is a is your limitation okay so uh, this is a very good adaptation of the sprinkler system and and what what are we looking at what plants are this this is bok choy okay so <clears throat> the other uh, reason why we do this way is um, for harvesting it is easier also for harvesting so this is the way we harvest okay if this is done we just pick up the foam board and here we go the whole board is standing uh, straight up you don't you don't fall flat because the weight will break the foam but when you carry it out straight flat, uh, straight like this then your veggie is ready for collection mm -hmm. right so compared to other method if you have to do it uh, hole by hole then your time is uh, very consuming right so this is how uh, how we design this system. Oh, so it's a it's a very convenient system. It's it's almost like a factory lot system. You can one bot by one bot come out and then you replace it with a new new batch. So and and having it like this too means you have access to every single plant. You can basically if you're tall enough you can reach the top. And this is for monitoring purposes also. Uh, you can pluck out all the diseased vegetables or with insects and you can you can have a glance. Uh, yeah. your whole plant system okay it, a good agriculture system will allow you to access all your crops uh, you don't have to you know jump through hoops to access it so this is a is a good system to monitor our plants and also the idea is this is what we call a vertical farming system okay this vertical farming system i um, has been in development for some time now the idea is by planting it in a shape like this we cut down the footprint okay uh, the, the the major problem of a frame system is always the sunlight okay uh, there are research that indicates that usually the growth will be uneven because of the sunlight exposure okay, so this is one of the challenge of an a frame system the how to overcome it is the way you orient your farm according to the sunlight okay uh, but overall even there are some variations it will all balance itself up okay so the, uh, this this is one of the research field of aquaponics and airframe system and uh, I think this is my first time seeing a, a commercial farm uh, using the airframe system in Malaysia okay. uh, the sprinkler is turned on now have a look Now here I have a packet of the tilapia feed, the extruded tilapia feed. Um, you will probably uh, have the, lec the lecture on feed formulation uh, later on in the course. Okay, this crude protein is 28%, crude fat 4%, crude fiber 6%, moisture 12%. Okay, the ingredients are animal proteins, plant proteins, grains and grains by-product fish oil, phosphorus, amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. 
Okay, feeding guideline: three to four percent body weight is two times frequency per day. Okay, as we have talked, um, or we are going to talk about feed formulation, the most important component is the protein, and you can see that the ingredients are actually not very much. Okay, unlike the the examples you have saw that with hundreds of ingredients, this is actually very limited. Okay, and this is by Cargill, one of the bigger feed manufacturers uh, in Malaysia. And this is a flow floating type. This is another type. Okay. You should reuse it for jet perch. Okay, so this is a this is for jet perch, and it's a twenty-five kilo bag. Oh, it seems from in Vietnamese. Yeah. In Vietnamese, huh? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, but we can see the. Okay, the protein here is actually a high protein feed, forty percent. The moisture eleven percent, and uh, crude fat six percent, ash sixteen, fiber, phosphorus, and lysine is one of the amino acids. Okay, so these are the uh, commercial feed that is used in uh, many of the aquaculture operation, and this one can also be used for a snakehead, the snakehead fish. Okay, as we as I uh, alluded to you all, feed formulation is one of the one of the more popular branches in aquaculture, and it's very lucrative if you if you can formulate a very good feed. Okay, this this uh, structure that we're in is sometimes called a net house or a greenhouse. Uh, the net is at the side. The top is uh, insulated. It's a transparent insulation. And it's a plastic film. And this particular block that we see now is 0 0.1 acre, approximately 0 0.1 acre. And uh, I'll let Mr. Ku tell you about uh, the features of this greenhouse and the costing to build one like this. Okay, so this is called the sawtooth type. A sawtooth means you have a roof that looks like a saw uh, knife. I mean, the, the sawtooth. Alright? So basically, on the top, you have a net which allow the hot air to release from, from here. If you build up a hot air in the mid of the day, the hot air can go through the net, okay? So that's why it's, it's more cooling compared to the one with the half moon, right? Um, the, the half round uh, the, uh, roof, which, I mean, competitively, it will collect most of the hot air and trap inside the, the, the curve. Okay, that's why uh, you are able to build this uh, roof, uh, which is uh, three meter from the from the ground. And if you uh, do this uh, for typical uh, half moon type, you probably have the higher uh, pillar. So to the same concept and the same uh, application is to make sure the hot air doesn't trap inside the, and, and harm your. Uh, uh, plants and the, and the cost how much does it cost to build one of these okay so typically if you look at this is around <coughs> six six ringgit per square foot all the way to uh, uh, ten ringgit per square foot it depends on what type and the functionality and some of the uh, what do you call it has the what do you call automated uh, shading system uh, then will cost you more additional uh, cost Okay, and this particular design here cost about thirty thousand to build. Okay, uh, so zero point one acre, thirty thousand. Okay, and the material here, the the Mister Ku has been telling me, uses a thicker steel steel beam, which is of a higher quality. And Mister Ku was talking about the airflow there. Let me show you. We know that hot air rises up, and and the sawtooth design allow the air to, let me see, to escape one way, to direct one way, and to escape from the other roof here. Yeah, okay, hot air rises, it is diverted by one roof and goes out the other roof here, correct? Okay, so the principle is uh, hot air from this roof here goes up, the other one is trapped there and it goes up the net there. That is not a plastic, that is a net that is vertically. Okay, uh, just like water flow from top to bottom, hot air goes from hot air goes up, always go up. 
Okay, and, and it's very important to keep the temperature cool, uh, especially in a net house or a greenhouse like this, because we know that uh, the dissolved oxygen is very dependent on air temperature. The higher the air temperature, the less oxygen is installed in the water, and, and it will drive the DO down, and if you are not careful, it can have sudden mass mortality. Okay, so in aquaculture operation, especially for tropical aquaculture, uh, we must pay attention to the air temperature. Okay, Mr. Ku will now talk to us in detail about uh, this bed here, how to how he built this uh, raceway bed and uh, what are the materials he used. Okay, initially uh, we are thinking of uh, doing uh, concrete with uh, BLC a bit, uh, and all these things, but the cost is, is too much. So what we have done here is actually utilizing what we call the U drain. So this is typically on construction site or the road site, you use the U drain to build the drainage system. Okay. So this is actually a U shaped uh, drainage uh, system, and this has uh, the depth of 1.5 meter, the wide also 1.5 meters. So. That way is enough for you to, to grow tilapia because tilapia usually live on the surface and the bottom part uh, you really don't want to, uh, to, to disturb it too much but when you have too short of the, too, too shallow of the water sometimes the, the bacteria of the bottom can get caught in the, in the fish so that's why we, we want to build this thing quite deep deeper than uh, uh, typically typical uh, way of uh, growing and and what are what are this okay so <coughs> this is called the HDP the high density uh, poly something so I forgot the polyethylene. name uh, polyethylene mm -hmm. so polyethylene uh, material uh, is, is basically once you lay down all the drain and it's not it's not uh, sealing so we have to put a layer of the HDPE, so it seals the water. I mean, it contains the water. And is is this reliable? I mean, does it leak? Does it ever break down? Yeah. So during the installation, you might find some small leaks. Uh, we have to patch it. But once uh, the water is in, and it will last uh, according to the supplier minimum ten years. All right. That's why it's uh, okay. So. Um I, I'm actually surprised that it's that deep. Let me, let me feel for that. Uh, there is a depth then. You can see the, the algae. You can see the algae there. Oh, I didn't realize it's so deep. Yeah, yeah you see. This is exactly the algae that you take up. Hmm. Exactly yeah. the algae there. Okay, so <laughs> so this is quite a deep system. Okay, uh, usually raceways, uh, they are built shallower a bit, but this is a deep system and that's why it's a hybrid between a raceway and a pond. Okay, and this is a U drain. And how much does it cost to build one of this? Okay, so to to build one of these, um, the HDPE itself costs uh, how much was it? Eighteen thousand, I think, per per greenhouse. And this costs, uh, I mean, the construction work and services uh, cost about forty thousand. Forty thousand for all of them, right? No, no. Ah, for six of them. For six of them. Yeah. Forty thousand for six bits. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's so about sixteen or you drain. Sixteen. So including the piping, the pumps, you know, all the infrastructure work, uh, this greenhouse costs about one hundred fifty thousand in total. Okay. So uh, those are interesting companies. One hundred fifty thousand for one of these units. Okay. And uh, so. Here we have uh, 12,000 fish uh, in the pond and if you successfully grow uh, to the bee size and you probably fetch about uh, 4 tons and 1 ton is about 7,500 so one time harvest is about 30 plus thousand so to get back it will take a few uh, batch of the fish the investment to get back the investment Okay, so uh, you have first-hand information from a commercial grower. So let's look at other features of this farm. Okay, we are now at this 
pump section. This is the air blower, and uh, there is a special feature with this air blower. Let Mr. Ko tell you about it. Uh, Mr. Ko, tell us about this. Okay, so this is a, a pressure gauge, which is connected uh, to some wires, and it has a high pressure limit and low pressure limit. So let's say if the pressure is dropping and you got some leak somewhere in the line when the pressure drop and touches this needle the alarm will kick off so let's for the sake of the demonstration i show you i purposely move the, the things here the alarm is moving can you hear the alarm Cannot, huh? let me show you the other feature is if you got electricity cut off and also the pressure drop of oh, alarm bolt. So when I shut down the power, basically to simulate when the electricity is cut off. Now you can hear the alarm is is uh, is kick off. So because this one is very critical for our business and if there's no attention given to the air and the, the pump is down all the fish will die because of lack of oxygen yep. okay uh, this is the lifeblood of the farm so this cannot fail so that's why we have this uh, alert system in the event it's dropped below a certain pressure or exceed a certain pressure we will hear this okay right now uh, we are simulating a power cut and these are 4 kilowatt pumps, uh, high power pumps, and uh, uh, that is powering the entire farm. Okay, okay. I turn on, huh? Uh, we have an, uh, a nice view of the, the greenhouses here. Uh, how many greenhouses do we have? Uh, nine. Okay, so nine greenhouses. There are nine greenhouses here, so it's, a, it's a quite a good size operation here. Uh, are they all in full operation or not yet? Uh, no, actually only uh, five in operation. We are building the sixth one mm -hmm. and then three more on the top. It's not operation yet. Mm -hmm. So we are still in the process of building it. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason we have three uh, level here because of the, the control of the land. And also by doing so, we are utilizing the gravity for our uh, uh, water supply. So later I can show you how, how we design the water supply. Basically the water is taken from the uh, tube well and it will store in the upper level and the water can flow down to the second level and the second level water flow down to the lowest level. And when the, the lower level is full, the sensor will send a signal to the valve, the valve will close and the same uh, happen to the middle level and the one on the top, it has a sensor with the radio signal when it's full also it will send a signal to the pump stop pumping <laughs> okay so. uh, we have been talking about this multi-level uh, system where water flow from the top to the bottom and uh, this is uh, done by engineers and so it involves a lot of uh, advanced engineering here so we shall have a closer look at it yeah okay, okay so uh, this is well, over there there is two tube wells for those of, of you who are unfamiliar with tube wells, tube wells are like well but it's in a tube form that goes straight down to the, the water table. And uh, let, let's hear from Mr. Ku about this tube well. So this, this tube well is about uh, uh, 60 foot uh, down and uh, it has a submersible pump which uh, produces uh, the, I mean, it uses the power about uh, one horsepower uh, both of them uh, is the same and when it's turned on it will push the water out through this pipe and all the way to my reservoir so this Samasaba pump are able to push the water for 30 meter height so this is a high pressure pump but low volume so this is a different type of application because the water supply is important to us by doing so it provides the constant water supply for us without any worries so we need to build a automatic system 
uh, over there uh, whereby it has a radio receiver receiving the sensor uh, signal from the, the reservoir and when the reservoir is full uh, every few seconds or so I mean six seconds it will send a signal here so when it's full the signal is sent here and the pump will stop by itself so in a way this we don't need to intervene on and off this is run automatically okay uh, in if you uh, want to build your own recirculating system in a home aquarium you can do this by putting a float valve okay when your water level goes down you know, the float valve will be turned on and the water will go in it's just like a toilet system uh, but this is done using electronics so there is a sensor at the reservoir that if the water falls below a certain level it sends a signal to this wirelessly through a radio frequency and it he commands the pump to start pumping and thereby filling that water and this really uh, takes a lot of um, work out of the farming operation so he doesn't have to worry about uh, the water level at all it's always there and uh, uh, so so in a farm uh, when you can automate certain system you should automate it now, this is the germination area uh, you can see it is it's very cute actually so these are actually sponge. Sometimes they use rock cool and sometimes they use sponge. So this is this is sponge. And the thing about this is, is uh, it doesn't use uh, chemical fertilizer. It's use uh, the fish water for germination. Yeah. So for for germination, we do use uh, fresh water. But once you have the the two little leaf come out. Then we switch to uh, using the, the water from the, from the aquaponic to, to fertilize it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you won't grow too green because the seed nutrient is used mm -hmm. once it's germinated. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have to keep feeding, keep, keep moisturizing it mm -hmm. with, uh, with your nutrient water. Mm -hmm. And the tricks of doing this is many people, uh, you know, didn't see these details is that this sponge it's not fully wet. This sponge is only three millimeter at the bottom is wet. Mm -hmm. You just provide the moisture for the root, not the whole plant. Okay? So that's why <coughs> this tray has hole in it. Okay? It has hole, the holes. So basically we drain the water. So if you soak with water, then you're in trouble uh, because the whole stem may be uh, affected by your water. So this is the tricks, uh, the details you must know if you want to germinate this way. The only place to wet is at the bottom of the sponge, that's it. Mm -hmm. If the whole sponge is wet, your plant will be damaged uh, after that. Yeah, if, if the whole sponge is wet, uh, you will encounter problems like root rot. Okay, uh, the and another reason for this thin layer is to encourage the roots to go down. Okay, uh, roots are uh, hydro positive; they seek out water. So by limiting it to the bottom, we we force them to go find their own water source. Okay, and uh, so these are details uh, that you will only know if you if you do it yourself. Yeah. So some people using the LED light during germination and we don't want to waste any energy <laughs> that's why once the leaf is come out we usually expose this to the sun and uh, we have to spray the, the nutrient water every now and then just to prevent it from drying out okay, hmm. okay. Um, a lot of people don't re um, sometimes we can be too caught up with using technologies that use LED lights and everything but we we fail to recognize actually sunlight is the best light for plant growing and uh, this is a uh, utilization of sunlight especially for tropics we have a lot of sunlight and we should use it and and LED lights are good but for con for countries that have uh, less sunlight or uh, have winter seasons uh, they, it's good for those countries but for Malaysia we should use sunlight this is how deep the raceway is it can it can actually be a swimming pool here okay if you put a a strong enough time you can do a raceway for human like a swimming pool and and this is the u-shaped uh, drain drain thing that is used and and i was asking mr ku why can't we cement 
it straight away, you know, plaster it like your wall, the wall in your house. Let's hear from Mr. Ku, why is <coughs> that so? Okay, uh, um, number one, this structure is not like the typical concrete with the steel uh, structure and you concrete. This is uh, like Lego piece one by one and you lay it down. And you see this joint is actually uneven. And once you have water inside, the stresses will tend to push this out outwards. So if you lay cement, the cement joint between these things, for over time it will crack. Okay, especially when you have water level different, the stresses are different, it will crack, it will leak. So what we that's why we prefer to uh, to do away with the HDPE. Okay, so the the cracking of the the joints here and the the compression of the cement on I suppose the movement of the soil uh, will eventually cause it to crack if you cement it. So they go with the HDP option to to mitigate that risk. Okay, so uh, so it is a very uh, deep system. Okay, uh, and one of these costs about two hundred something ringgit. One of this U shape. Okay, so it's it's not it's not cheap to construct until <coughs> so it's 200 something per you and the other factor we we accounted for is these are removable uh, in a sense that because this land is rented from others if we are asked to leave to move to other place the pond can be removed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so so it's like this if you if you if you go the rental route, you have to design your system in such a way that you can take everything away <laughs> when you leave the farm. And this are this is a U, and this is the what we call cinder blocks, right? Yeah. Cinder blocks. This is a it's like a sand brick, but a larger version of a brick. Yeah. And this is the inlet. No, this is uh, overflow outlet. Oh, this is the outlet. The inlet will be the inlet side. Okay. Uh, those of you who want to build a swimming pool, you probably can build something like this. Uh, this is the reservoir tanks and uh, it has some sensors here. Uh, let's ask Mr. Ku about it. Okay, so this is what we call a water level sensor. Uh, it basically is just a three cables. Uh, the green one is providing the, the, uh, the, the current to the bottom. And depending on which uh, line the water is touches, the relay moves the other way, on or off. That's it. So meaning that if the water level drop beyond this uh, cable, meaning the water is not enough, and the signal will send to the radio to control the power on uh, the tube well pump. And when the water level touches the red line here, the current went through, the relay is flipped the other side, and the pump is going to be off. That's it. So uh, basically this is a, this is an off switch and this is the on switch. And so when the water level falls below it, it turns it on, and that turns it off when it reaches that. Yeah. And, and this is a wireless system. That's the, where the radio signal is sent to the to the tube well we've seen uh, just now. Okay, so this cuts down the, the wiring that you have to do. Yeah. Now we were up there in in that uh, level, the top level here. That's where the first entry of the water, the, the water from the tube well. Then from there, it is uh, transferred to this second level. It is a sta step level, the second level here. And it's controlled by this valve here. Now this is an electromagnetic valve. Okay. Uh, if you send a current to this system, you can turn it on or turn it off depending on the model that you choose. Um, in this case, normally this is closed, so that means water does not flow through. When there is a signal to it, an electrical current, it turns it on. Okay. So again, the tank is powered by the three sensors that we look at just now. Uh, when the water is low, it will send a signal to there to to, uh, to this valve here. To transmit the water to the tank. Okay, so this is a uh, this is something you all should know about an electromagnetic valve. Okay, if you look here, look at here. Okay, these are not mosquitoes. Okay. Uh, 
it lays eggs in the water and it produces what we know as blood worms. Okay, the red, the red worm that uh, we, I, I used to feed it to the fish as a conditioning food. Okay, if you want to breed your fish, uh, blood worms is one of the best uh, live feed that you can use. So this is not the Aedes mosquito that uh, is transmitting this. This is the, the, blood, the one that produces the blood worm. And it's very common in areas that has a lot of high organic matter because their, their larvae will usually uh, make their pupae at the organic matter. Okay? They will form these this lines here at the bottom. And when it hatches, you, uh, when it, it's in larvae stage, it has this uh, red blood color. That's why it's called a blood worm. Okay, if you observe the raceway here, there is this uh, center part uh, that is a that is a blue bucket. It has a very special function. Uh, let's hear from Mr. Ku. Yeah, this is uh, our own design. Um, we used to call this uh, artificial river, <laughs> but actually, what it does is like if you if you didn't put this thing on, the bubble will tend to flow in all directions. And this uh, half-cut uh, drum is to make sure we force the bubble to f when it lifts up to the surface, it falls through, it flow in one way. So in a way that you create some current to the, to the stream and also you push all the fish waste to one direction. Otherwise, if you have feed waste from the other side without this, it will be blocked here because the air bubble will tend to push it back. So in this way, we make sure anything that we do, the, the, the current is going one way. This is the purpose. Uh, it's a current generator uh, developed by Mr. Ku himself. Okay, uh, the whole farm is, has air supply. So he's making use of the air supply here to push the current. Okay, and it's a very ingenious yeah. plan. It's very, it's a very nice design. Yeah. So okay. if you use the the air bubble properly, you even can do an air lifting pump uh, without using electricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's talking about the air lift system. Okay, yeah. I um, we shall cover that in in the coming lectures. Okay, this farm is culturing two different types of fish, tilapia and jade perch we are looking at here. And this is a very beautiful fish and it has a, a high fat content. And um, let's hear from Mr. Ku, what are the differences between, what is uh, his experience in culturing these two different kinds of fish? Okay, <coughs> okay jack perch uh, requires uh, warmer temperature, the water uh, temperature a bit warmer. Uh, around 25 to 30 Celsius. So it's, it's good for to wear this fish and it has higher value and has, uh, as the doctor say, it has high fat omega-3. Uh, this fish originally from uh, Australia and uh, it has been a, uh, what do you call, a great delicacy in the restaurant right now. And Usually it takes about eight months to wear compared to tilapia which about take about six months. So uh, also the feed also uh, to grow this fish you need to provide them with higher protein value of the of the feed so that it can grow according to the country. Oh? Okay, so uh, I, I remember when this fish was first introduced in Malaysia, everybody was calling it the Omega fish okay, because of its uh, 
fatty content like salmon and and uh, so this is um, a higher value fish compared to tilapia and Mr. Ku, which is easier to culture, tilapia or jet perch? Actually they are almost the same uh, the jet perch depending on the oxygen uh, and and the what you call the temperature because jack perch is very sensitive to changes so pH temperature uh, and also um, <coughs> the, the feed that you give them uh, you must be very careful however the mortality rate of uh, jack perch actually is lower than the tilapia mm -hmm. uh, but tilapia can withstand a wide range of the, the parameter which is uh, you know you will withstand let's say if your high pH is dropped down to uh, 6.3 mm -hmm. it's fine even go up to 7.4 also is fine but for jack perch if you water pH changes rapidly you will see their behavior behave differently uh, normally the good sign is they start to uh, not eating uh, they they are fasting or even you throw the, the pellet they will eat uh, then you have to watch out for some uh, stresses they might be going through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, tilapia is generally considered a hardy fish, so it's supposed to withstand a wide range of chemical changes, the uh, water chemistry changes, pH, uh, ammonia, nitrate, nitrate. Generally, they are able to tolerate a wide range. Okay, um, so jade perch is um, the more sensitive ones. And what Mr. Ku was saying is that uh, he's actually alluded that you can actually use it as a what they say canary in the in a coal mine. So if they are unusual, you will know that uh, your water parameter needs to be checked. Okay, and uh, so in his experience, this is a he um, has a lower mortality in his experience. So um, again, this fetches a higher value, but it also requires a higher protein content feed which is also a higher cost. Any uh, protein content, as we have discussed, uh, is the one of the major costs in feed formulation. Mr. Ku shall uh, walk us through the, the price that he sells, X-Farm. X-Farm means the, the, the price that he, the, the money that he gets when the fish exits the farm. X-Farm price, this is known as. Uh, let's tell us about the tilapia and jet perch. The okay, uh, tilapia now, the pricing is quite, uh on the higher side compared to before MCO and right now the tilapia usually have four grades so A, B, C and C, C which is the smaller one so A means anything above 800 gram which can uh, fetch about uh, 10 to 11 uh, ringgit per kilo and then B you will get about 850 a kilo and then C you get about seven and a half and uh, the CC, uh, which is the smallest one, uh, which is less than uh, the 600 gram, you usually get about six and a half uh, ringgit per kilo. Now, as for the jack perch, uh, actually the market is quite small because uh, it's expensive, and not many people uh, know about this fish. But X Farm, they usually take from us uh, 26 per kilo. Mm -hmm. So. Uh so we can see it's almost triple the price of tilapia, uh, the jade perch. Okay, uh, but again, uh, as Mr. Ku says, uh, it's a it's a smaller market because it's not a very well known fish yet. Uh, but it's the the salmon of a uh, freshwater, yeah. and so so these are the actual actual farm price that he gets when he sells the fish. Okay. Uh, the research in aquaponics is, uh, it used to be thought that uh, the fish can completely supply the nutrients for the plants and the plants can completely strip it away. But uh, research has shown that this is very difficult to maintain and you will always end up with excess nutrients. And in this farm, all the, ex the waste, the excess nutrients are all funneled to this uh, setting tank, the final setting tank here, which again is submerged some it again uh, is subjected to further processing to break down the nutrients. Okay, and this this is eventually goes to this biofilter. Now you are seeing this is what we call the K3. 
what you have seen in, in my demonstration is a mini version of this. This is the... The thing about this is it's supposed to be a neutral buoyancy material and when, the, when it's subjected to an air lift system like this, it turns it around and around, uh, making it to be 100% in contact with the water. And the reason for this final processing is, is, is it has a third uh, output, a third production system. It's a fertigation system. Uh, if you see over there, that is the fertigation that is uh, going on. Um, let's have a look at that. Uh, in the, the current trend in aquaponics is what we call, sometimes it's also known as a decoupled system, where the, where the, where the water from the aquaponics is finally go through a final processing stage and usually it's used for soy farming or in this case, fertigation. Now, fertigation is a, again a soilless planting technique that requires uh, the input of nutrient solution and in this case, it's all the fish water that has been processed. Now, this is the soilless medium that is used. Its function is to mainly hold the roots and to sometimes lock the nutrient in place. And this farm uses um, this coconut husk that has been grounded up into a uh, finer powder like this and a, ri a burnt rice husk, a kind of biochar. And, and what is the ratio that is uh, okay. used here? We use uh, one portion of uh, rice husk and two portions of coconut pea. So the rice husk itself, it has some nutrient also, uh, especially the potassium. So in a way, it gives him some some nutrient, but not much. Uh, however, it's a good medium to uh, constrain. I mean, uh, constrain <laughs> to contain the water, so that you won't dry out totally. But if you use only the coconut pea, when the water is less, it will uh, be difficult to contain any water. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is the reason why we mix it, and also the. The rice has uh, is is cheaper than the coco coco pea. So mm -hmm. the the rice husk is, is the hull of the of the rice that has been made into uh, charcoal. So it's and we have learned that charcoal or activated charcoal has this adsorption property that can lock in certain nutrients. Mm -hmm. So when it's in contact with the fish nutrients, it also it acts like a sponge that locks the nutrient in place. Then the plant roots can on, on demand, take it out from the yeah. biochar, and so so you cannot mix too much of a good thing. Okay, yeah. that if you use hundred percent, your plant there will be too much water in that, and it's not good for it. So two to one is the ratio. Now let's look at the plants there. Now this is the final output of the farm, uh, a chili fertigation system. Now in in Malaysia, almost all the chili production uh, uses uh, synthetic fertilizers for their production. When we talk about fertigation, uh, they use uh, AB and all kinds of uh, chemical fertilizer. But this farm, it uses the the water from the fish, so it it totally maximizes the the fish water usage. And and what plants are we looking at, Mr. Ko? This is uh, they call the four six one chili. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. one chili. And what do we do is uh, after the mineralization, all the water from the fish, we reuse it. Uh, however, uh, later stage when it's flowering and uh, and uh, the chili is coming out, uh, we might need to add a little bit of potassium and magnesium mm -hmm. because and also uh, calcium mm -hmm. because uh, chili requires a lot of um, calcium, magnesium. Potassium. Uh, so the fish water itself, the nutrient is not enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Mr. Ko just alluded to the nutrient imbalance issue. Okay. Some some the fish sometimes fish water contains a lot of nutrients, but sometimes it lacks certain elements that is essential for the plants. And and especially in its flowering stage and fruiting stage, uh, you may need to supplement it with uh, other synthetic fertilizers. Okay, uh, for those of you who are who are who are working in aquaponics, and when it's your first try, it's inevitable that you need to supplement because you just can't get the levels exactly right. So Mr. Ku was telling me, uh, this is a 
this is a more expensive method to to construct this system but it's a good method because it lifts the plants off the ground which is usually a source of a uh, pest and one of these beam cost uh, 18 ringgit around 18 ringgit 6 meter 18 ringgit so uh, you can do the math here uh, it will add up to your cost and some of them they just put this on the ground but then you will run the risk of your a pest problem and chilies can be susceptible to a lot of viruses and pests okay so we have reached the uh, end of this farm tour uh, Mr. Kui, can you? Okay. okay. End of this farm tour and I'd like to thank Mr. Ku for giving us this wonderful opportunity to see an aquaponics farm in operation. And the good news for you all is he is taking intern students. Okay, and many of you watching here will be going for your internship uh, next year. And, and he is... Where is this place? Where is this location? This is... Uh, we, we call Bestari Jaya. Mm -hmm. And uh, next to Unicel. Eh? Okay. Uh, University next, Selangor. University Selangor. So this mm. is Bestari Jaya in Selangor. So uh, he is taking intern students uh, next year. H however, if you want to come here, you can either travel back to your home every day, or if you're up for it, you can stay in one of those containers uh, over there. So this container is used for storage, uh, accommodation, office, and kitchen. Okay. So, yeah, we are welcome here if you want to stay here. But if you uh, cannot the tahan the 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 what do you call a uh, simple way of uh, uh, living, then uh, you must travel back then. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if 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 you want the luxury way, travel back to your home every day. Oh, okay. okay. You can bring your tank and sleep on the top there also. Can. <laughs> yeah. You can camp here too. Okay. So this is a developing farm and and. If you are into aquaculture, it's a very good opportunity for you to s see how a farm is set up yeah. and to learn along the way. This is one of the fastest ways for you to learn. Yeah. Okay, so that is, that's it for today's lecture and uh, as usual, I'll see you in the next lecture.